the data that I'm looking at closely from the Federal Reserve, which was last time the typical homeowner in America has $300,000 in, in total wealth, which includes 401k, but housing yeah. would be the big component. Right. Is it you guys that had a report that said that homeowners had a 40% higher net worth? Who in the world would pay a million dollars for that small townhouse? You, know, you guys are great great salesman and you sound very confident that the market's going to be great and everything we know that prices have increased much more since COVID. what what's your outlook on the rest of the year in terms of prices and reduction and uh, yeah yeah no it's 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 something that i've brought up since i saw the report welcome back to the podcast everybody today i'm in washington dc here at a branch headquarters of the National Association of Realtors with Mr. Dr. Lawrence Yoon. How you doing, man? Hello, Ricky. Good Thanks to see you. Me. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. So Dr. Yoon here is the chief economist for NAR. And uh, first off, thank you, man, for inviting me into your office here and having a convo with me. Well, you are very influential in the real estate industry and for the members, so very welcome. So uh, I'm glad that when you reached out to me that we can work it out. Thank you. Thank you, man, so much. So this week you're having your legislative meetings right which yeah. is somewhat of a conference yes right tell me about that what the what it consists of what the objectives are so we have about 10,000 realtors across the country coming into Washington we hold it every year in May uh, generally uh, they would speak with their members of Congress on certain important real estate issue one of the issues that we are fighting is capital gains tax reduction because as we know home prices have risen so much that some people are now beginning to hit above the exemption level and that is preventing people from selling their property not mm -hmm. wanting to a list mm -hmm. so we are talking about that on commercial real estate or investment property 1031 exchange is very important to assure that is protected something unique this year at the baseball stadium where the nationals play is an off day but we are going to have 10,000 realtors in that stadium. We are inviting all members of Congress, congressional staff to show up. We don't expect 100% participation from Congress, but maybe 80%, 90% people coming, shaking hands, uh, and talking about the real estate issues. Watching a baseball game? No baseball No baseball, game, okay, just, just showing up, just hanging, hanging out, out, and yeah, having yeah, a little yeah, yeah. networking event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. So, so the capital gains issue. Mm -hmm. So that is um, the issue about someone living in their house for two years mm -hmm. um, and then being able to sell that mm -hmm. and avoid the capital gains. Yes. Right. That's the issue we're talking about. And mm -hmm. so there's limits on that. Mm -hmm. um, what are the limits right now? Uh, so uh, for the uh, single individual is two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a married couple is a half a million dollars. I hope I got the numbers correct, uh, but with the price increases in many parts of the country, now some parts uh, like where you are from in Alabama, home prices are still very reasonable mm -hmm. even after the price run up, mm -hmm. so they're not reaching the top, but right. in other areas they have surpassed the top, and therefore when one sells a home, generally homeowners say, well, if I sell my home, I don't pay tax, I don't pay capital gains right, tax. Right, right, right. But now more and more Americans will face potential tax and we're saying, look, it has not been indexed to inflation. Price of everything is rising. We also need to raise mm -hmm. the tax bracket appropriately mm -hmm. uh, to make it fair. Yeah, it's almost, um, it almost falls in line with how much uh, a bank account should be insured for, yeah, right? Yeah, 250,000 right. is not like it, not yeah, what it used to be. Right. Um, so the 250 for a single, 500,000 for a couple, that's, that's the capital gains, yes, right? Yes. So if you bought a house for 500, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. minus all your costs and everything, and you sell it over two years later, you, you claim it as your primary, mm -hmm. you sell it for 750, mm -hmm. that's a $250,000 mm -hmm. gain. As yeah, a single yeah. person, yeah. you can do that and not pay taxes on that 250. That's right. That's right. If you sold it for a million, mm -hmm. you wouldn't pay taxes on the first 250, but that's you would right. pay taxes on the second 250. Yeah, so okay. say uh, places in like Tampa Bay, where they have seen price gain of 30% in a single year, in mm. 12 months, 30% mm. price gain, mm. then another 10% gain. Maybe this year is going to be more neutral, flat line. Yeah. But nonetheless, say someone who bought 10 years ago, they may be beginning to hit that limits. Uh, and we don't want that situation where homeowner begin to think about tax implication because they always saw you buy a home, mm -hmm. you sell it, you know, you don't pay tax and then you move on to the next one but uh, tax could prevent some people from wanting to sell. Now, I didn't think about this mm -hmm. when it comes to um, inventory, mm -hmm. 
right? Because I think builders are down. I think existing homeowners are sitting on two, three, four percent interest rates mm -hmm. and they feel locked into their homes. And now you're introducing a new problem, mm -hmm. and that is the possible capital gains because of this ceiling mm -hmm. on what you can mm -hmm. sell it for. Um, this is, this is, that is a big problem. Yeah, if it was indexed to inflation, I think one can clearly understand, but it has not been changed for, I think, over uh, 20 years or even 25 years. Mm -hmm. So given price of everything is rising, price of eggs are rising, uh, the amount that can be excluded from the tax should also be rising. And then the 1031, what are you guys, what's the current situation and what are you guys proposing for that? Well, you know, current situation is a good system where 1031 exchange offers, say, investment property owners, a commercial real estate deal. You sell a property. So in order to, say, defer taxes, you invest in other similar property mm -hmm. and then one do not have to pay taxes mm -hmm. uh, condition. Uh, but Congress is saying, look, we don't know what this is. Let's take it away. We think this is a tax loophole. Mm -hmm. But our study is showing that once you take away all these many commercial deals will not happen, investment deals will not happen, yeah. and it actually reduces uh, economic activity. So right. we are trying to show all the numbers. So they're trying to take it away completely. Uh, there are some, I always had some discussion, and there are some permanent members of Congress who every year wants to mm -hmm. remove it. But mm -hmm. then we have to convince the middle, or the you know, large section of the yeah. middle, uh, believe to say this is very important for economic growth and for the local community. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that, that NAR comes in, and it's not just about real estate agents. Mm -hmm. It's not just about, you know, um, the agents and, and you know, uh, the things to do with specifically agents. This, you guys are diving into consumer, everyday buyers and sellers, and trying to do what's better for the, the overall population, not just real estate agents. Uh, you know, the organization is comprised of member committees, participation, so they express what they are seeing from their clients. So if they are sensing their homeowners are feeling a little nervous about the capital gains tax, that filters up. And through the discussion, they said, look, NAR should be focusing on this issue or that issue. And certainly we know the importance of real estate for the health of the economy and just American dream. People want to live a good life and real estate provide that opportunity through that ownership. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. I love learning about that today. Um, switching gears to the feds, raising rates. Mm -hmm. I believe you put an article out that said it was harmful, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, what did you mean there? Why did you say that? Uh, the Federal Reserve job, their mandate is to control inflation. And with inflation having run up to 9% last year, you can say they did not do their job. Uh, now one can say that there's other factors that was outside of the Federal Reserve control that caused it that. But since their job is to control inflation, they said, well, in order to control it, let's raise interest rate. And they have aggressively raised interest rate, the fastest rise in interest rate in short duration since early 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, and our so realtors are feeling this impact. Mm -hmm. Their clients are mm -hmm. feeling the impact. People who thought they could buy a home suddenly realize, oh no, I cannot make that mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. I have to back away. And my comment on the latest increase is really related to more of a small bank's failures. Right. Many small banks, they did a prudent investment. You know, you, you receive some deposit and they say, I'm gonna put it in safe asset like US government bond, mm -hmm. uh, which pay 2% interest. Mm -hmm. uh, but as long as you are paying the depositor 0%, Making 2% is not that bad. Mm -hmm. But if the depositors leave and they are leaving because now Fed has raised interest rate, they are saying, okay, come put your money in my bank. We mm -hmm. offer you 3%. So the money is leaving, is flipping uh, right. the many small bank upside down. Yeah. So, so the small bank cannot lend and they're in a more of a zombie mode. So this is already tightening the policy beyond what the Federal Reserve is doing. Yeah. So Fed needs to be aware of this and therefore I think it's an unnecessary harm on the latest rate increase. Basically you feel like that inflation is, is coming down and the Feds have already done their job to try to initiate that and they're just not being patient enough. So the inflation was 9% middle of last summer. Mm -hmm. By Christmas, inflation was coming down to about seven. Mm -hmm. the latest number is 5%. Mm -hmm. And interesting part is that the biggest component of the inflation is related to housing. Mm -hmm. Now home prices 
are not part of inflation, believe it or right, not. Right, 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 right. So it's the rental component yeah. and what the homeowners would pay in rent hypothetically. So when they look at the rent, rents are still rising strongly. So what's happening right now is that overall inflation is coming down at a time when rents are not yet coming down. Right. But rents will come down because we have so much apartment construction across the country, yes. all these empty rental units coming onto the market. Yes. So Fed needs to be mindful. Yeah, inflation will come down by year end. Yeah. So there's no need to raise interest rates. Right. I'm sure that people um, may have confused the comment with thinking that you're referencing mortgage rates because mm -hmm. From what I gather you know, through doing this, I realize that there's a lot of the general public that doesn't realize that mortgage rates are more tied towards inflation rather than the, the Fed rate. Um, you guys are predicting mortgage rates continue to ease mm -hmm. throughout the year and into next year. Tell us how you come to this conclusion. What are you looking at? What data? Walk us through the process of that just so people are looking to buy a house, real estate agents, or whoever kind of understand the mechanics there. So when the Fed raises interest rates, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship with mortgage rates. In fact, sometimes even in news we'll say Federal Reserve raised interest rate, and then you look at the mortgage rate, it actually declined. So it's going in the opposite direction. But if you look at it over a longer time horizon, when Fed raises interest rate, it just generally pushes up the mortgage rate, mm -hmm. even with some bounces. And when the Fed reduces interest rate, it's gonna do the same. So the market, the mortgage market, are beginning to price in that the Federal Reserve will stop raising interest rate and may even cut interest rate towards the year end or early next year mm -hmm. uh, as they see the inflation numbers are much calmer. Mm -hmm. So how do I come to the uh, forecast of mortgage rate going from current around 6.5% mm -hmm. average uh, to possibly 6% or even below? Mm -hmm. uh, there's two factors. One is inflation will come down, that will help on the mortgage rate or the thinking on the Federal Reserve about possibly cutting interest rate, uh, which the, you know, the Wall Street will factor that in. Mm -hmm. The second big factor as to why mortgage rate could go down is the following. If you look at most mortgages consumers take out, FHA mortgages, they're government, government guarantee. Veterans Affairs mortgage, you know, we thank uh, the veterans for their service, government guarantee. Even mortgages originated by Bank of America, Rocket Mortgages, eventually get sold to Fannie and Freddie mm -hmm. who are government guarantee. Mm -hmm. So what does the government guarantee mean? That means that if homeowner defaults on their mortgage, people who provided the money, say the Wall Street to, through the process, they still get the money back through the government. So there's an incentive to provide that liquidity to the mortgage market. Mm -hmm. And consequently, historically, if the government borrows at one rate, mortgages with government guarantee is only a little bit above that. Right. In fact, uh, to use a little bit of technical term, it's 170 basis point above yeah. that, uh, which is historical average. Above the 10-year the tre treasury, tre tre yeah. tre treasury. Right now, it is 300 basis mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. we can just get back to the normal spread, yeah. uh, I think this morning, treasury yields were 3.5%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Under normal spread, five and a mortgage half. rate would be 5.5%. 5 5.4, and and whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the three-point spread now, mm -hmm. is that, I've heard different things, do you, and the most sensible um, one I've heard is that because the government backed and people buy these mm -hmm. mortgages on the second market, um, that they feel like since rates are high, people are going to refinance when rates come down, and they feel like they have to make something off these mortgages that they're only going to keep short term. Do you feel like that's the case of why we're seeing this three-point spread versus the normal one and a half to two percent spread. Uh, so you know it's interesting why we have this large spread. Again, mm -hmm. you know it's a government guarantee. It's mm -hmm. sure, uh, but you know one of the reason could be that Federal Reserve is unwinding something called quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. So during the early months of COVID, they went all in to provide maximum liquidity 
they said, we're going to buy mortgage-backed securities, all these securities, uh, which provided the liquidity. Now the Fed is saying, we are holding on to too much. We have to sell it into the market. So they are reversing that process. So that is also uh, causing mm. a little spread. Uh, but also the possibility of refinance and, and some of the wholesale mortgage market. Mm -hmm. They lost money when the Fed aggressively raised interest rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they lend money to the home borrowers. They wanted to sell to the Wall Street after packaging. Mm -hmm. But given the mortgage rate went up so much, so many people lost temper money temporarily. And now they want to at least compensate for uh, yeah. some of the losses they Right, right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So inventory, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that for a second because it seems to me in the 80s mm -hmm. when we had 30% less people in the mm -hmm. country, 30% yeah. less existing yeah. homes, mm -hmm. I'm just guessing on those numbers, mm -hmm. but we had anywhere from two to three million mm -hmm. homes for sale yep. at any given time yep. Yep. during that entire decade. Yep. And then we come into the, the 90s and 2000s where it ran up to four million mm -hmm. in 2008 and now we're sitting under a million. Mm -hmm. If you take out pending deals, we're yep, probably yep. around 500,000 yep. or so. Yep. Um, this is the real crisis, I believe. Um, I guess my question to you, have you thought about where this so-called inventory could possibly come from? Builders are down, existing homeowners uh, don't wanna sell for another reason I learned today. Um, foreclosures aren't even half of where they were pre-pandemic. People have so much equity in their homes. If they did become defaulted, they could just sell the property. Most people are in the situation they could sell and take money off the table. Um, do you have any idea where we could see um, a, 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 a flow of inventory? I mean, the natural process is for the builders to build. This our empty home. We have a rising population. Naturally, it means we need to build more. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, when you build it, it's generally unaffordable home, but, you know, larger size, more modern. It's not mm -hmm. for the first time buyers, mm -hmm. but it's for, it's for the trade up buyers. And mm -hmm. as trade up buyers buy, mm -hmm. they release their old inventory. Right. So at least the chain reaction will help that process. And the builders were greatly underbuilding for almost 10 years going into COVID. So mm -hmm. we actually had a housing shortage in 2019. Right. It simply got a very acute, exacerbated shortage during COVID, and we are still in that shortage uh, situation. Right. Uh, you know, talking about this 10,000 realtors in Washington. Uh -huh. Another issue that we're saying is we are short on inventory. This is denying many young families from participating in American Dream because of lack of inventory. Is there a quick way to release inventory? Because building takes time, you know, it's yeah. like a multi -year, something that can be done immediately. So one thing we are still talking to members of Congress is to say, look, real estate investors, there are some investment property out there. If they sell property, they face capital gains tax. And you can say that's fair, but now in a time of inventory shortage, can we reduce the capital gains tax, even say six month window, whatever it is, mm -hmm. to incentivize some of the real estate investors to say, look, this is a great access strategy and you can reduce capital gains tax temporarily if you sell it to a genuine first time buyer or say a buyer uh, who are owner occupancy. Uh, so uh, it, we are in the initial stage of discussion. Let's yeah. see how it moves along. Uh, but. Uh, generally speaking, you say investment property owners, certainly they must be a little wealthier than general population. Mm -hmm. And you may say that's the, uh, correct, but at the same time, we need inventory for yeah. many first time buyers, young yeah. people who want to buy. Yeah. So we are in discussion of that. Seems like we're in this vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I saw an article where uh, Zonda mm -hmm. did a survey that 98% of uh, millennials mm -hmm. want to be homeowners mm -hmm. because they want to build mm -hmm. their own equity instead of someone else's. And uh, so I went back and I looked at you guys' reports that said that the average age of a first time home buyer was 33 mm -hmm. in 2021 and 36 in 2022. So that kind of tells me first time home buyers are in that 33 to 36 age range, um, which are the millennials, mm -hmm. which make up 72 million mm -hmm. Americans and 98% of them, according to the survey, yeah. want to become homeowners. Yeah. Um, so I look back at birth rates and realize in 1990, 33 years ago, we had a massive spike. Mm -hmm. And so we have this record number of 33 year olds this year who will be 34 next year, yeah, 35. Well, then we have another group yeah. and that birth rate stays about the same mm -hmm. for a good 16 years. I believe that we're in a situation where we have more pent up demand mm -hmm. 
of people who want to buy houses, not just housing, rentals, but these people want to buy. Mm -hmm. I think we have more pent up demand, of course. I believe you guys report 27% or so last month or whatever it was. We're first time home buyers. Mm -hmm. So this, this group makes up a big chunk of the people buying houses. And I think that with interest rates, it suppressed these people back on the sidelines for just momentarily until rates kind of come down. And as rates come down into the sixes um, and opens up the floodgates, we're going to be in this real situation, I believe. And um, do you believe that, do you think, no, not to put you on the spot to speculate, but I just have this theory that we're kind of in this perfect storm of no inventory, more pent up demand than ever, and dwindling mortgage rates, which is going to open up uh, this massive wave of buyers with no inventory and possibly create a price situation, again, not as bad, I don't believe, as it was in 2021. But isn't that, and I know home prices aren't necessarily tied to inflation, but it, it, it trickles down to supplies and wood and lumber and everything else, create a second wave of inflation, which will then uh, bring mortgage rates back up. And then we're just in this vicious cycle because of this situation we're in with inventory and supply and demand. Well, I mean, you know the numbers, Ricky. Uh, so, <laughs> like the you know demographics, how many people are in their thirties and so forth. Uh, you are doing a lot of homework, so you are natural uh, with the numbers. Um, yeah, but you are right uh, in terms of pent up demand and the desire for home ownership. You know, mm -hmm. even if the survey was slightly off, say ninety right. percent of the millennials right. want to buy. This is part of the American dream. They yeah. know that homeowners build wealth. You pay rent check, that goes away. You know, it just go goes away. So people understand that. So when the mortgage rate, the anticipated drop in mortgage rate uh, that is anticipated uh, means that the gates will open, maybe not a massive amount. I don't expect 3% mortgage rate for the remainder of my lifetime. I think people who got 3%, congratulations, it was your bonus rate. I don't like the term locked in because locked in sounds like you are in a jail. No, people mm -hmm. are loving it. People are loving mm -hmm. their 3%. In fact, they are loving it so much <laughs> that if there is an additional child in the family, Generally, they need to move to another house with a larger bedroom, but they don't. They're saying, I love my 3% more than the baby, you know, so, so, <laughs> so people are, you know, it, so, uh, but I think uh, eventually you have all these pent up sellers. Yeah. So jobs are constantly changing. Maybe the new job is on the other side of the town, but they're mm -hmm. postponing that movement because again, they love their 3%. So there's degree of pent up sellers. And if the gap between 3% rate that homeowners have and the market interest rate begins to decline, it's gonna to begin to facilitate some yeah. selling uh, yeah. because it's just natural to say, no, this house simply do not fit my right. style. Right, right, but right. we need to reduce that gap. Yeah. And I think the gap will begin to uh, narrow based on my, uh, hopefully it turns out correctly that inflation comes down, Federal Reserve begins to reverse some of the policy, mortgage rate comes down. So that's gonna open up some of the pent up sellers yeah. coming into yeah. the market. Yeah. But we need more home building to assure that there is plenty adequate supply for rising population uh, that's occurring. Yeah, builders couldn't keep up before mm -hmm. and now they're down mm -hmm. from where they were. Mm -hmm. And now I believe we've got more people in the market who want to become a first time home buyer. Um, something's got to give. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I've been saying maybe there needs to be some kind of policy around incentivizing builders, mm -hmm. you know, to build more or something of that nature, you know, just throwing stuff out oh, there. Yeah, yeah, you know, realtors are very smart. So when we have 10,000 realtors, there's 10,000 opinions, 10,000 <laughs> viewpoints. And yes, so there is a lot of viewpoint to say that right. uh, sometimes the builders are hindered at the local level on excessive regulation. So they're spending $70,000 just filling out the form, uh, you know, to assure that, you know, water regulation and all this part. That makes the home building very costly. Uh, so if one was to reduce some of the regulation, then we can do more ready supply, mm -hmm. uh, more supply coming onto the market. Mm -hmm. We need clean water, we need clean air, but we also need more housing. So <laughs> we have to see what the right mm. balance is. We cannot be so restrictive to say, oh, if you dig a ground, it's gonna damage something. Uh, mm. We have to start building mm -hmm. more homes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what about, let's switch over to affordability for mm -hmm. a second, because that's a big issue with yep. a lot of people. You know, a lot of the people who talk about, you know, um, how bad the market mm -hmm. is, talk about how a lot of Americans can't afford to buy a house. 
Um, back in 2020, I believe the average was $1,072, uh, your mortgage payment. And um, it peaked out about 2,000 a month, which is double um, back in November-ish. And now we're down to 1,700 and something, um, but still way above where it was. Um, we do have a household income up, mm -hmm. right, to try to comp compensate that for a little bit. But just so they can hear from the horse's mouth on affordability, um, what is your viewpoint of affordability, you know, to buy a house, right? And, and where is it going and how are we gonna solve that problem? Uh, so, you know, in terms of the affordability on home price and income, yes, incomes are rising. And currently about 30% of the markets across the country is actually seeing some reduction in prices. San Francisco being the most extreme example, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like where you are from, prices are still rising. Right, right. I've been talking to uh, realtors from say Charlotte or uh, Atlanta, prices are still bumping yep. up. up. Uh, in fact, uh, about one third of the newly listed properties are getting multiple offers yep. and being sold above. So demand is there, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the- And interest uh, rates aren't, haven't even dwindled yeah, down yet. Interest rate has not uh, declined. <laughs> uh, so, so the affordability is first, we need income to catch up with some the price gain that mm -hmm. occur, but more importantly, mortgage rates to reverse and go down. So that will make the affordability easier. But the longer haul, longer haul is that we don't want to see sudden spike in prices in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good for homeowners, but right. it's a very bad news for first time buyers. Yep. We want that ladder of opportunity to mm -hmm. become homeowners to be there right. without a missing rung. Uh, and the only way to do that is to have adequate continuous supply of new construction uh, with a rising population to occur. Um, and you know, th th so this would be it. And the other part uh, that's happening on affordability is, I mentioned San Francisco prices going down, small townhouse, million dollars, and you say, who in the world would pay a million dollars for that small townhouse? Well, if you are unhappy with it, go to Alabama and buy a mansion <laughs> for uh, you know, $800,000. So I think many office workers who have little more flexibility to work remote, uh, maybe either they go to the next county, which is more affordable, or in some cases, all remote work. You may see people migrating out of expensive cities and go into middle America to say, I can buy a mansion mm -hmm. uh, and live mm -hmm. a more peaceful life. Ah, so your message to people who have been priced out of the market is maybe look in different areas. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know, even the next county could just mm -hmm. simply offer, especially mm -hmm. if one do not have to commute to downtown every single day. Right. Uh, if it's a hybrid model, two times a day uh, coming into office, well, mm -hmm. less commuting means you can live further out. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. So people watching this, mm -hmm. they may, some people may be, come from the mindset that, well, you guys are real estate agents. Mm -hmm. Ricky, you're a real estate agent, you know, you're with NAR. Um, you can twist the data around however you want to and, and make it look good or bad. Um, you know, you guys are great salespeople, right? That, that's what I hear a lot, you know, you're, you're, you're a great salesman and you sound very confident that the market's gonna be great and everything. Um, what do you say to people like that who, you know, may say, we're just great salespeople. You We're know, just I, twisting data around to make it look like it's something great on our benefit so that people buy houses so we make commissions. Uh, you know, uh, one thing is that I speak with many other economists and some economists are very pessimistic either about the economy, future direction of the U.S., say fiscal policy, national debt level being so high, or oh, it's uh, very specific to housing. They think, well, we are in a bubble, maybe it will crash. So I hear all this discussion. But at the end of the day, I think one has to just look at the factual information. The factual information is the following. We don't have those risky subprime lending that gave mortgages to anyone with a heartbeat, you know, mm -hmm. no income documentation, mm -hmm. good thing. So now people are getting mortgages, are soundly qualified, unless they were to lose their job, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little different story. Fortunately, we are still adding job overall. Mm -hmm. So that's helping uh, that picture. So we don't have bad mortgages, which is the reason why we don't have the, any increase in foreclosures uh, in any meaningful way uh, currently. One can do a lot of analysis here and there, uh, and one can make a very logical conclusion to say, don't buy home at this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the end bottom line is homeowners build wealth. Yeah. Uh, we came out with a report recently to show that in the past decade, someone who owned their property in the US, they have gained over $100,000 just by being homeowners. Mm -hmm. So people who make those pessimistic assessments, well, they will do their analysis, 
But what do homeowners do? Independent of analysis, they, their wealth grows. Right. Uh, so I think, you know, that Was is, it you guys that had a report that said that homeowners were 40 percent, uh, had a 40 percent higher net worth than a renter? 40 times more. 40 times so, more. So uh, the data that I'm looking at closely uh, from the Federal Reserve, which was last time they came up with the report was 2019 pre-COVID. But we know that prices have increased much more since COVID. So accounting for that sort of conservative estimate is typical homeowner in America has $300,000 in total wealth, which includes 401k, but housing yeah. would be the big component. Right. While the renters typically have only about $5,000. So mm -hmm. that is a 40 mm -hmm. multiple difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's something that I've brought up since I saw the report. Um, so you're, I, I, I don't remember exactly where you, what you guys' projection was for prices in your last projection. What, what's your outlook on the rest of the year in terms of prices, home prices? So I'm gonna do the economic model. So economic model spits out actual precise figure. Now mm -hmm. don't rely too much on the precise figure, mm -hmm. but it's just baseline. Yeah, right? yeah. So home sales this year will be down 9%. Okay. Uh, home prices will be down 2% because like San Francisco, they're experiencing quite a meaningful decline in San mm -hmm. Francisco mm -hmm. uh, areas. Uh, and also some of the fast growing regions like Austin, Nashville, Boise, super strong job market, but mm. prices simply got ahead way too fast compared to fundamentals. Mm. Uh, I think in the past, since pre-COVID, prices in Austin grew by 70%. Now they're seeing 10% decline. Uh -huh. Someone who bought one year ago, maybe they're unhappy. Someone who bought a home three years ago in Austin, what's the big deal? Right, yeah, yeah. right, right. Uh, uh, so overall forecast is that 9% reduction in uh, unit sale because first half we're still down. I think the second half will turn positive mm -hmm. year over year gains, but insufficient to make up for some of the first uh, half uh, declines. What about January 1 to, to January 1? Uh, it was right. down that, to about, about 20% to 20 on the unit sales. Uh, but 2024, things will light up, right. mortgage rate a little lower assuming job gains continue, I'm looking at possibly, you know, 10%, 15% unit sales growth mm -hmm. and prices turning positive three, four, 5% next year. Mm -hmm. So this year is a transition year for uh, people in the real estate industry, mm -hmm. a little transition year. And one can say even last year was a transition mm -hmm. year, but 2024 things will really light up uh, or one can even say even second half of this year, one will begin to see that steady improvement occurring. Earlier this year, there was a report that said we were on track to do 4.6 million sales, mm -hmm. 4.66 mm -hmm. or something, and then the latest report showed 4.4. Mm -hmm. So that's a deceleration of mm -hmm. number of transactions. Is mm -hmm. that what you guys are seeing, and, and you think that's just going to continue? And what, how many transactions for existing home sales are you projecting for the year? For the point. year uh, is 4.7 million. 4.7. Uh, so second half again being a little better than the first half. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's just put it into perspective. Pre-COVID 2019, mm -hmm. home sales were running close to five and a half million. Mm -hmm. Go back to year 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of the people in the audience were mm -hmm. not even born in the year 2000. <laughs> in the year 2000, there was 5.2 million home sales with a population that was about 40 million fewer Americans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. when we project a forecast of 4.7 million this year, mm -hmm. this is below the baseline. Right. I mean, so, we, so there will be a little bounce coming up in mm -hmm. the upcoming years mm -hmm. just to reach back to the baseline. Right, right. Now switching gears to real estate agents, number of agents mm -hmm. in the country. Yeah. Um, it, it, based on what I saw, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't look at it with a microscope, mm -hmm. but based on what I saw, it looked like we saw the first year over year true decline mm -hmm. since the Great Recession mm -hmm. in terms of number of agents. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, what, do you, what are you seeing there? Do you guys have projections there? What, what are you guys seeing or the reasons why agents are getting out of the business? Mm -hmm. Talk to me about your thoughts on as far as um, just how many agents uh, are out there and kind of what direction that's going in? Uh, you know, pre-COVID 2019, 1.4 million agents, mm -hmm. uh, realtor members, I should say. Mm -hmm. Then it peaked at 1.6 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I think by two, three years from now, it's gonna settle down at around 1.4 million mm -hmm. uh, range, go mm -hmm. back to pre-COVID condition. Mm -hmm. 
I always admire the entrepreneurial spirit of Americans who want to try out business. Mm -hmm. So I admire, but the reality is real estate business is super competitive out there. Mm -hmm. Given so much competition, not everyone can succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when we look at the data, uh, roughly about 10% or even some years, bad years, 15% of the members would drop out. Of mm -hmm. course, the other new members who are joining in and trying out their entrepreneurial skills. I'm not an yeah. actual business person. Which skills work better than others? Yeah. Uh, but we know it's a fiercely competitive industry out there. And we know uh, it's a good 20% of the agents make six-figure gross commission income. Okay. You know, before 20%? 20, about, about 20%. Okay. Uh, then you have about... 30% uh, of agents who make less than 20000 in gross commission income and mm. you add the business expense and you feel like right. they were just spinning wheels. Right, so right, know. right. There's a good 20% who actually are making a living yeah, basically yeah, doing yes. this. Yeah, good living. Good living you know? And then there are, I've heard numbers, but it's hard to really uh, confirm. There's another 100, uh, 1.5 million who are, are, who are real estate agents, but not realtors, not members of NAR. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, so the uh, realtor membership is one point, today about 1.5 million. Okay. Then there's another 1.5 million who have real estate license, uh -huh. are not realtor members, but many tends to be inactive. Okay. So maybe they have left the business, but their license are still valid. Okay. So it could be that, or people who are just viewing it part time. I'm not sure exactly reason, but in terms of the productivity, uh -huh. realtor members are doing far doing the thriving business compared right. to people who are just holding real estate license. And let's just clarify for the audience, mm -hmm. if you are not part of NAR, if if you're a member of NAR, mm -hmm. that means you pay a membership yeah. to NAR, mm -hmm. not just the local board, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an additional, additional fee on top of your local board of realtors membership. Uh, so, so we have a three-way agreement, which means that as a realtor, you want to use the name realtor name mm -hmm. along with other access of you know realtor uh, resources like RPR database on uh, you know property uh, specific uh, so other trying to utilize as a member um, so once realtor decide to pay a due they're not paying for any specific association they are paying all that goes to three associations mm -hmm. now how it gets divided there's some it depends upon locality mm -hmm. and state mm -hmm. uh, but they cannot say okay I want to pay to uh, a local association, but I don't want to pay the state association. Okay. It doesn't okay. work like that. Okay. They, they pay it and automatically. Got you. So when you pay your local board, that's yeah. that's paying for your NAR right. membership as well. The state membership and national membership. So these yeah. so these agents that aren't a member mm -hmm. means that they have a license, but they're not part of their local board. Right. Is that that's what right. that means? That's right. yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay. And that could fall. Could also commercial agents who aren't part of their local boards for residential. Could that also, could commercial agents fall into the category of people who aren't members of NAR? Um, so commercial uh, real estate licensing, actually that's a good question that I don't have a good answer okay, to, but, okay. it, but we know that many commercial real estate practitioners are not necessarily realtors mm -hmm. uh, because they use... Uh, different MLSs yeah, yeah, and yeah, stuff, yeah. right, yes. right, different, pla I was wondering about that. So it could be people who aren't part of their local board because they can't afford the fees, yeah, they're still right. active, yes. but... Mm -hmm you know, residential agents or commercial agents yeah. who just aren't members of their local board. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So we were talking before, and just to give everybody a little bit of your background, you were born in South Korea. Yes, yes. Came here when you were eight years old, yeah, yes, South yeah. Carolina, yes. and went to Purdue. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, you've been a part, you've been the chief economist for NAR for how long? Uh, so I joined NAR uh, from the year 2000 as a junior economist okay. in the back office. Mm -hmm. Then we had that foreclosure crisis in 2008. Uh -huh. Things were all up. And then prior chief economists left. Uh, and then they were searching for it. And they said, well, would you like to come in and try <laughs> to fix the thing? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, one thing uh, great uh, is it, not my efforts, the efforts of realtors, advocacy team, all through communication channels, uh, we were able to pass something called home buyer tax credit back during 2008, mm -hmm. essentially to say we have abundance of inventory, not enough buyers. Mm -hmm. Can we provide simple incentive to get the buyers back into the market, mm -hmm. even temporarily to stop the mm -hmm. bleeding? Mm -hmm. So buy a home and one gets $7,500. That's mm -hmm. the tax legislation that the realtors worked on. Yeah, I remember Congress. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
It, it, it sounds like the exact conversation yeah. you're having now, just opposite. Opp <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We need more supply. Right. We need incentive yeah. to get more supply. Back then it was, can we find some buyers? Yeah, can yeah. we do something yeah. even temporarily yeah. to get more buyers? Yeah. And now we're saying, hey, we need sellers. Yeah. Can we do something even temporary yeah. Yeah. <coughs> to get more sellers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, on behalf of myself, all the real estate agents out there, uh, we appreciate you and all you do for us and uh, you know the general population. So thank you so much for your time today. This has been a great uh, interview and uh, let's do it again at well, some point. Uh, good questions, great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good day.